Hello again, and welcome back to Bite Size Kierkegaard. And today we're still in early polemical works. I'm trying to wrap this up, but we might go, turn it into another video uh, if it goes on too long. Uh, but the, this is the the more interesting part of this this uh, collection. Uh, this is what Kierkegaard published as something called From the Papers of One Still Living. Uh, and then the subtitle on that is Published Against His Will, which is a little bit of like what? Uh, and then by Sir and Kierkegaard with a weird spelling for some reason. He you know, later changed that. Uh, it's with a J here, which I don't understand, but like whatever. Okay, it's, maybe it's some old spelling of the name. Uh, from the papers of one still living. What does that actually mean? So this, I'm, I'm not going to explain it fully, but there, there's an idea that uh, Kierkegaard's father had this deep guilt in him uh, from cursing God when he was a, a farmer on the, you know, the Jutland or Jutland. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. The Heath out there, you know, he was a farmer and He's really upset and he cursed God, you know, why did you do this to me? So he, he, bar he, 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 he had that, this guilt with him for the rest of his life. And uh, part of that, he had some, uh, you know, some idea that his offspring wouldn't live to see um, the age that uh, I think, it, I believe it's the age that Jesus died, which is like 34 or so, 33, 34, I forget. Um, uh, yeah, and this part, you know, this is Kierkegaard saying, I'm still alive. It kind of like Monty Python might lie. I'm still alive. Uh, published against his will is a little bit, this is me speculating, um, but part of the, the reason that this is published, the, the first part is a criticism of Hans Christian Andersen's uh, novel, Only a Fiddler. And uh, I, I believe that published against his will is kind of referring to how this came about. Um, you know, back in the days, it's the, the golden age of literary Denmark. Uh, Copenhagen is a place to be. We have Hans Christian Andersen walking the streets. We have Sir and Kierkegaard walking the streets. Uh, these folks that w we know their names today when, you know, Danish philosopher pretty much only refers to Kierkegaard. Uh, Danish author probably, you know, comes to mind, you know, Hans Christian Andersen. So these, these guys are contemporaries not really friends they were acquaintances and they knew of each other and they knew that they were well respected they kind of bumped into each other and hans christian anderson said something to the effect of hey um uh, kirkgaard you know like you know take a look at my novel you know like i'm expecting or you know not you know in a nice way and it's like are you going to review that you're going to take a look and kirkgaard kind of like politely said yeah yeah sure sure you know i'm i haven't gotten around to it you know i'm planning on it uh, and then later on, he's kind of like, ah, oh, I shouldn't have agreed to that. So I, I feel like that's, this is where this is coming from, published against his will, but could be totally wrong, just speculation. Uh, in any case, I, I alluded to the first part. Uh, the second part of this, uh, this work is something called Battle Between the Old and the New Soap Sellers. Uh, and then there's a little bit that we get as background material to sort of help us understand this whole book. Uh, and then after that, it's just a bunch of footnotes. Uh, incidentally, I, I want to recommend that um, it's a little hard to reference that a lot of these Hong translations are great. They have so many footnotes in the back here, uh, and it's not always obvious, but I, the, the best way, uh, the, the footnotes, uh, they, they sort of start over in the different sections. So it goes through one to 100, and you go to part two, and it's, one through 200 or, or so forth. So the best way to look these up is really go to the footnotes, start at the top and it says notes to pages 15 through 19. So if you're reading 15 through 19, your footnote is gonna be there. So for instance, like I see footnotes 89 through 108. Uh, but if I keep going forward, you know, they reset and they go forward. So like just a tip for reading these Hong translations, especially things like concluding unscientific postscript. I remember how I had the a paperback of that and the footnotes it was like out of control monster um, I believe they might have been formatted differently in the paperback uh, versus the hardcover but in any case I'm getting ahead of myself there that's the end of his uh, first authorship and we're not at even at the beginning uh, I think I, said, I mentioned it before but Kirkura didn't really uh, consider this the beginning of his authorship even the next book that we're looking at which is the uh, concept of irony 
which I have I happen to have here ironically enough <laughs> uh, this is, we'll be looking at hopefully next time this isn't even you know the start of his authorship the start of his authorship is either or very famous work uh, so we'll get to that eventually <laughs> um, but we're not there yet um, but yeah so yeah started with Anderson as a novelist um, it's kind of a harsh criticism of Anderson um, based on his latest work which was only a fiddler uh, Kirkhart is kind of railing against Hans Christian Anderson saying basically on page uh, 76 here he says Anderson lacks a life view um, and it's a life view is more than a bunch of abstract ideas uh, from life experiences and, and repeatedly he says this that Anderson is, is bringing too much of his own life uh, into his works which I mean it seems reasonable that you would do that as an author right like you find inspiration in your real life and you put that into your works uh, but Kierkegaard is kind of criticizing like you can't just like randomly pick up these pieces like oh this interesting thing happened or oh, this thing depressed me today I'm gonna write a story and there's like no arching overall purpose to the whole thing and so that's that's the whole idea behind all this um, and he's saying it in a very complicated way but there's some interesting points uh, again uh, as I mentioned in a previous video, uh, Kierkegaard is also explaining here, he's emphasizing he's not really interested in politics. Uh, he repeatedly, he says this. Um, and uh, uh, he actually says, at least Hans Christian Andersen also hasn't succumbed to politics. So it seems like, okay, these are two literary guys um, who are conversing with themselves in a literary way and they're not really politicians they don't want to go into that sphere um, yeah so it's an interesting thing that he's re he's emphasizing that again I thought that was really interesting also anticipating some of his famous quotes on page 78 there's actually an origin of one of Kierkegaard's most famous quotes um, uh, there must come a moment I say as uh, Dob, uh, when, as Dob observes, life is understood backward through the idea. Of course, Kierkegaard is famous for saying life is understood backwards, but can but is lived forwards. It can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. Uh, a little bit of a contradiction there, and apparently this is where it comes from. And Dob was a. Let's see if I wrote this. I believe you. Ah, uh, yeah. It says. Read the footnote, David. <laughs> so I'm going to jump to page 255, which has the footnote, the explanation for the footnote. Uh, Carl Daub, um, professor of theology at Heidelberg. Uh, so skipping forward, uh, the uh, quoting him, the act of looking backward is just like that of looking into the future, an act of divination. And if the prophet is well called a historian of the future, the historian is just as well called, or even better so, a prophet of the past, of the historical. Uh, and then this is Hong um, uh, actually explaining. Uh, actually, not Hong. We're still in Julia Watkin territory. Julia Watkin wrote these notes again. I'm sorry, Julia. I keep calling you Hong. Uh, Kierkegaard repeats this thought of Dob, putting it together with the thought of thought that life is lived forward life can be interpreted only after it has been experienced but the past informs one's own one's understanding and grasp of the future oh very interesting like that's a that stood out like wow like okay that's where that comes from um but yeah I, i'm just reading through a couple of my notes page 81 um Kierkegaard saying the novel writer they need a life view uh, it's their center of gravity. Um, Hans Christian Andersen is going to make fun of this metaphor. I feel like Kierkegaard, I feel like in the past video, we've there was also a sort of like this metaphor about a nebula forming, and now we have like a little center of gravity, um, you know, like a little gravitation thing, you know, like little satellites. Um, and it reminds me of a little uh, caricature that was written up in the Corsair later on about sort of like the whole world revolving around Kierkegaard, or kind of poking fun at him. Uh, but he, he likes these metaphors. Um, but yeah, the, it, it, it needs a, a purpose, and Hans Christian Andersen's novels are missing this purpose. It's kind of just like thrashing him. Uh, this was an interesting dichotomy. I think this was also on page 81. Um, 
uh, when a life view is lacking, either you need a theory, a dogma at the expense of poetry, or something finite, um, but to, that's too much of mixing in the author's own life. And so this is pitting sort of something that's too abstract, too infinite on, on the one hand, and on the other hand, something that's too concrete, too finite, too rooted in, in the, the ordinary and the you know, it doesn't have like a, a direction or an overall purpose. So like these are two extremes. Um, yeah, so interesting. Page 82, author's own personality is intruding again. Um, and then page 83, I think, has this just like, where it's getting to the end and it's just like, oh man, like, the, like it's just, um, let me see. Ah, in a novel, there must be an immortal spirit. It sounds very Hegelian, eh? Uh, that survives the whole. In Anderson, however, there is absolutely no grip on things. When the hero dies, Anderson dies too. And at most forces from the reader a sigh over them both as the final impression. <laughs> this is kind of like a little bit of his uh, Kirk Guardian humor. You can see it coming through them. And like, and just like, ah, <laughs> getting, getting tired of this novelist, you know. Um, yeah, and then uh, there's one other thing I wanted to mention from this before we wrap this one up, because um, I think I've said most of it. Uh, there's a little bit of wordplay on page 90. I believe other places too. Uh, I like these translations because they try to preserve this Danish wordplay. Of course, I'm reading this in English, and so I'm not going to get these, but there's like a poetic rhythm or poetic... Um, uh, they use the same word you know, in different ways. Oh, in this way, um, there's just a quote here. That is, it happens not once, but many times that Anderson, in the course of the narrative, loses. And the Danish word is tabe, T-A-B-E. -E. I'm not pronouncing that right, I'm sure. His poetic balance and thereby drops, again, tabe or tabe, T-A-B-E. His poetic characters out of his poetic creator hand so that even, uh, so that these even set themselves in opposition, to, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there's this this um, this rhythm loses is the same word as drops, and you can see how those can be related. But um, there's a lot of I, I really appreciate these translations because they always highlight um, you know when that happens. There's a lot of this wordplay going on, and I, I like that in English. So I like to see uh, Kierkegaard is you know playing playing with the language, and he's he's li liking that. It's almost like a little bit of. A, it's like a poetry mixed with dad jokes, kind of something like, I like that sort of rhythm. Um, so that's it. That, that, this, I think, uh, if you get this book, I, th I believe, in my opinion, like this this commentary on Hans Christian Andersen is probably the, the most interesting thing in the book. And the, the thing, I, even though it, it is very hard to read, it has a very stilted style and it's kind of, Oh, man, it's kind of just like thrashing against Hans Christian Andersen. Uh, and then there's um, this um, this commentary that, that helped me a lot again, this international commentary, uh, but is more speculating on kind of the, the interesting things like the, the personalities and the conflicts and speculate, um, you know, like Hans Christian Andersen forgave Kierkegaard, um, but he was still obviously kind of upset. Um, we can find this in the background material, which I'll kind of skip to now because I think it fits in better here. Uh, but he, in I believe it's in 1840, Hans Christian Andersen writes this satirical play. <laughs> he's really, he's kind of getting back at um, Kierkegaard. He, he turns Kierkegaard into like this uh, hairdresser, uh, this kind of like a dandy hairdresser, which is kind of, um, <laughs> I could see it because like, you know, like at this time, like student, uh, Kierkegaard in his student days was kind of running up the bills with his father's money and buying these fancy, uh, you know, like fancy clothes and buying a bunch of books and things. And he was also kind of famous for having this kind of pompadour or this crazy crest of hair you can see in some drawings that just goes. Whoo. And so like, OK, maybe him being a hairdresser is a little bit of a jab at that, you know. And the, the, the name of this play that uh, Anderson wrote was called A Comedy in the Open Air. And this was actually performed, apparently. Um, and <laughs> yeah, and the, the character that, that Kierkegaard, that's kind of playing on Kierkegaard is called Dalby. 
Um, and Dalby, the description is the manager of a company of traveling players disguised as, as the following, a farm hand. <coughs> I don't quite understand because in this play, it seems like he's just a hairdresser, but I don't know. But it says he's a farm hand, a hairdresser, a scenery painter, a poet. I could see poet, um, a prompter, a wardrobe mistress. So it's just all, yeah, all these things. Um, and he's kind of saying all these things, these like these sort of Hegelian phrases and um, these ridiculous things. Um, and it's kind of like it's poking at fun at him. Um, yeah, there's one point where it says, what do I will it is to will it is one thing to will it is another to be able. Will is often a phenomenon in the most respectable form as it appears in Hegel's great attempt to begin with nothing. You know, it's like uh, and he's like, I'm a Hegelian, you know, like um, but Kierkegaard in his journals, which is part of the selected entries, journal entries in the back of the book, Kierkegaard was drafting up kind of a reply. He never ended up publishing it, but he was kind of like, come on, man. Like, I'm not a Hegelian. Like, uh, what are you talking about? You know, like, he was really offended. So uh, this, um, I think the this uh, international commentary said it best was like that these guys were two kind of neurotic, sensitive guys, and they both kind of, you know, like got each other down and like okay whatever they got back at each other well hans christian anderson says that he forgave kierkegaard and then there's like i don't know it's kind of maybe not worth the time but like there's spe some speculation like did he really forgive him you know like a little bit of a drama and there's some papers that he um people wrote to hans christian anderson and kind of alluded to this kierkegaard he's up to no good you know like kind of like if it was in the back of their mind and they were still thinking of like this guy like can't trust this guy but um it's speculation you know but like officially hans christian Anders said said no you know like i offend i i i um he got me down but like i forgave him you know, whatever whatever um yeah but uh interesting some interesting drama there uh, but as i said before i think that is the the heart of of this this next part is kind of a weird thing. This this part that I call the the uh, the old the battle between the old and the new soap sellers. What? <laughs> oh, this was intended to be a play to be performed, kind of like that Hans Christian Andersen thing, uh, but it was never performed. Um, and it's kind of speculated that it's kind of a weird thing. There's all these characters. There's some funny things that I'll point out, but these these characters are obviously kind of riffing on real life people part of the university or so forth and we don't really know we kind of lost that context um but the the audience the intended audience for the play would have been his fellow classmates and so you could imagine it's like them kind of poking fun at their their professors and so forth but um i'll just point out some fu some funny things in here probably the most interesting thing is like one of the characters is a fly and i'll read the fly's description um the fly character a fly who has wisely wintered for many years with the late Hegel and who has been so fortunate as to have sat upon his immortal nose several times during the composition of his work Phenomenology de Geist, the, the phenomen Phenomenology of Spirit, that is. <laughs> so this is a um, just a fly in his play and he doesn't really show up until the very end, which I'll mention if I can find it here. It's a very short place. So. Hold on. Um, where did he go? Ah, here it is. So the the there's just a bunch of philosophers talking and kind of arguing about Hegel and so forth and this fly just flies by as he is saying this a fly buzzes past him reciting some Hegelian propositions and the horn can be heard sounding out some political axioms <laughs> it was just like this fly has actually like absorbed so much Hegel philosophy that he's actually just reciting this random stuff as he's flying around it's kind of ridiculous but um yeah, a little bit of this, it's like, there's a little bit of philosoph philosophical debate here. Um, there's some interesting anticipation of what will come later. On page 107, he references Leporello in uh, Mozart's Don Giovanni. 
Uh, he's going to dedicate a huge section of either or to Don Giovanni and saying, go see Don Giovanni uh, in the voice of A, the, the, the pseudonym A. Uh, page 111, also anticipation, literary crop rotation, one of these characters mentions. Uh, this will also be an either or, um, something called rotation of crops. Uh, and then there's just general debate here. Um, these philosophers talking on page 114, they're saying philosophy should be accessible to the people. Uh, and page 115, they're talking about the importance that philosophy is practical for everyday life. Um, and then there's a little bit of, uh, they do reference philosophers, so they'd reference, there's a little reference to Aristotle kind of indirectly. Um, Spinoza, Hegel, of course, Descartes, a lot of references to Descartes. So like Descartes and Hegel, probably mostly. And they're kind of saying philosophy, modern philosophy started with Descartes, uh, with doubting everything that is doubtable, uh, going through Spinoza, and then we've ended up at Hegel. And, um, and they're kind of saying, well, this is the culmination, this is everything. And then there's one one guy who always says, no, I've gone beyond Hegel. And that's his, kind of his catchphrase. No, I've gone beyond Hegel. Um, and then there's some interesting things, where like technically, like if you're Hegelian, like you're, the world is continually, continually in process, it's never finished, uh, which is kind of a criticism of like, you, why you can't live by Hegelianism because you can never be sure of it. It's always ch something that's churning and you can't put your finger on it. Um, so you can't base your life on that, which is one of the arguments for living by faith instead. Um, we'll see that. But um, there's kind of like some poking fun of this. Um, let me see where I find it. On page 119, uh, they're saying, uh, so and so, it was finally. I decided to refer him to the academic academic institute founded by the Pritaneum. I have no idea what that the World Historical College. This, however, was not yet completed, and only atrium could be used. But this was so large that four professors lectured there simultaneously without disturbing one another. <laughs> it's kind of like, like what is going on here? Uh, but the, that's that's totally a jab at the Hegel. You know, world the World Historical College. Uh, is never completed. That that's totally just riffing on Hegel Hegelianism, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. And page one twenty one again dissatisfaction with Hegel. Uh, I did mention the fly on page one twenty three. The fly buzzing around, uh, reciting Hegelian phrases. <coughs> um, so yeah, um, I'm sorry this went on so long, and I, I do appreciate you listening. Uh, and I've already mentioned the, the uh, Hans Christian Andersen play, which actually comes later on this text. But um, And then Kierkegaard saying, I'm not a Hegelian on page uh, 220 was uh, some diary entries. Uh, and then I think I just want to leave with one last thing. It's like there's some interesting that are, things that are published. I'll put it up on the screen now. Uh, one is the title page of uh the pa from the papers of one still living, published against his will by Soren Kierkegaard with a J for some reason, you can see it right there. And then it's kind of fun at the bottom, you can see you know, Copenhagen available at CA Reitzel's, printed by Biano Luno, 1838. Uh, just a little snapshot of history. Uh, and then this, uh, I'll follow it by, hopefully you can see it on the screen now. These are some uh, draft pages, uh, pages one and two of the soap seller drama. This is kind of like one of the, the crazier pages. Um, there's a whole book of these which I've, I've showed before but it's kind of fun just to see the handwriting uh, and I don't know what is going on in his mind but somehow there's some organization to this madness but just a little glimpse into the the madness <laughs> um, well that's fun and, um, yeah whoa 25 minutes so yeah let's finish it up so <laughs> it turned into more than bite size but I think we've wrapped up the early polemical works and uh, thank you again Julia Watkin not Hong uh, the next one will move into the concept of irony, which is still not the beginning of the authorship, but this was uh, the, the master's thesis, the master's thesis uh, and this is getting into Hong territory, Hong and Hong, the husband and wife team um, who translated all these and it, it was their life's work basically. So uh, really respect them for that and love these editions. So next time 
we're making progress going on to the next book i hope to see you next time um if you'll let me so <laughs> um yeah but i appreciate it and um yeah thanks again bye